Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Program Director of Valor Medical Services. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation from our series of continuing education for pre-hospital providers. Now, before we begin, there's a few things we need to go over. First off, the information presented in this program is intended for use by trained EMS providers. Also, due to variations in protocols and scope of practice among different states, departments, and agencies, this program may discuss or depict procedures, medications that are not acceptable in your daily use. If you see something in this presentation that varies from your agency's policy, always follow your department's protocols. Also, none of our authors or presenters of this program have any conflicts of interest or financial relationships they need to disclose. We do have documentation of this on file available in our office upon request. While we do our best to make sure that all the content we present is the most current available, participants are reminded that medicine is indeed a dynamic science and thus changes rapidly. So things may have changed since we've written or compiled this program. Please always follow the most up-to-date information available. In closing, if you have any questions about this or any of our other programs, please email us at info at ValorMed.net. Thank you very much and welcome to the program. Alrighty, now that we've got all that legal stuff out of the way, before we get started, let's talk about coffee for a second. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, you probably want to check out CoffeeBrandCoffee.com. They're an online retailer, American owned and operated. They have a wide variety of coffees, teas, hot cocos, all sorts of different flavors. They've got all sorts of organic teas. You can get coffee in bean form, ground form, K-cups, whatever the your heart desires. I've had several of the different blends and several of the different flavors. Absolutely fantastic. And because they are an American-owned small business, they don't have a big warehouse, so they don't have a big supermarket sales business. They roast it, they bag it, they ship it to you. It'll pretty much be some of the freshest stuff you'll ever get. Definitely highly recommend them. And they've got a promo code out for us now. If you use promo code Valor SDS, you get a 5% discount off any order. So you can save a little money, try some fresh coffee, see what you like. They've always got different flavors coming through on their website. Some are permanent, some are limited time only. And if you look right there in the picture, you can see they've even got, yes, double caffeinated. Definitely a winner around this office. Alrighty, now let's get to class. Hi, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm one of the instructors at Valor Medical Services. And in this presentation, we'll be discussing field triage for disasters and MCI responses. Now, there are a few core criteria we'll talk about, the first of which is the MUCC's impact on development of the CDC field triage decision scheme, as well as SALT. We'll analyze the triage methods used for SALT, START, and JumpStart. JumpStart, if you're not familiar, is a modification of the START system that we use for pediatric patients. Now, the Model Uniform Core Criteria for Triage came out in about 2013. These guidelines were based on science and consensus and recommended 24 core criteria for all MCI and triage systems. These were used as the basis for the CDC Field Triage Decision Scheme as well as SALT. Now, the goal they had when they developed these guidelines was come up with a triage program that's applicable to the widest variety of ages and the widest variety of incidents. For example, they wanted something to be as applicable to a school bus wreck with kindergarten and first graders on it as it would be to a fire or a major incident in a nursing home. They wanted something that providers could learn and apply quickly to a wide variety of responses. Now, when we talk about what is field triage and why do we do it, well, to a point we triage every day. We determine if this patient in front of us is critical. Do we need to go lights and siren? If we're not on an ALS unit, do we need to call for one? If we are on an ALS unit, do we need additional providers to respond, possibly drive us in? Do we need possibly a helicopter to respond for urgent transport? So we always triage patients on a regular basis. But this approach is based on mass casualty events. So we're going to talk about what a mass casualty incident really is. 
Triage for these is the process of prioritizing multiple victims when resources are not sufficient to treat everyone immediately. For example, like I said, a school bus wreck with 30, 40 kindergarten kids on it. As a first in responding unit, you're not going to have enough to treat all these children immediately. What you need to do is you need to triage and treat the worst first. In simple terms, we're trying to allocate our limited resources to do the most good for the most number of patients. Now, there's a variety of triage systems out in the country today, five or six different variations that I know of. Most of the common ones we see are either based on SALT or based on START. Now, SALT is an acronym for SORT, Assess, Provide Life-Saving Interventions, and then Treat or Transport. START is an acronym designed for simple triage and rapid transport. Jumpstart again is the pediatric version of START. Now when we look at SALT overall, SALT is based on very simply starting with SORT. The first thing we want to do is sort our patients. And we'll sort them based on are they walking? If they are walking wounded, we assess them third. We don't need to focus on them immediately. Are they waving? Are they purposeful? Are they calling out to us? Well, we can assess those second. Lastly, we'll look at still or patients with immediate life threats and we can assess those patients first. To give you an idea of how this might be applied, imagine your unit first into a big wreck on the highway, right at the split. Traffic's backed up all over the place. You finally manage to get up to where the patients are and where the wrecked vehicles are. And you have a patient walking towards you. He says his arm is broken. You can see that, yes, his arm is likely broken. And therefore, he does need care. However, we can't immediately stop right there and provide care for him. So we can direct him to go to a safe zone or a casualty collection point. Or stand on the side of the road or go sit on the edge of the grass, anywhere that he can be, that he can be safe while we focus on other patients. As we move further into the incident, we see another person. They're stuck in their car. They're waving. They're purposeful. They're saying, hey, hey, help me. I'm over here. Well, that's great, but that's not a priority at this moment because we can tell they're conscious, they're waving, and they're purposeful. The patient we're most concerned with is any car that has a patient who is Still not moving, not responsive. Do they have an immediate life threat? Is there something we can do that will save their life that we can do only if we don't get bogged down with the first two patients we see? So again, we're trying to do this to spread our resources as adequately as possible to deal with the most possible patients. Now, as we move a little further into the algorithm, we get to the patient that we're going to assess first. They're unresponsive. Are they breathing? Well, if we open the airway and they're not breathing, we likely categorize them as being deceased. Do they obey commands? Are they able to talk to us? Do they have a peripheral pulse? Are they having respiratory distress or major uncontrolled bleeding? At the same time we're doing this assessment, concurrently we can be initiating life-saving interventions. Oh, we see major uncontrolled bleeding, we can initiate bleeding control, possibly even applying a tourniquet. If the patient is unresponsive, if we open the airway, we give two breaths. If it's a pediatric patient, does this start them breathing on their own? If not, again, likely they'll be considered black tag or deceased. Based on your level of certification and your agency policies, you may consider a needle thoracotomy. I know some agencies, if they respond to a large trauma incident, you have a patient with chest trauma, unresponsive, not breathing, no radial pulse, you may actually consider this rather quickly. In the event it's a hazmat incident, do we have auto-injector antidotes available? This would be more designed for, again, hazmat response, possibly WMD, things where we may get into large-scale chemical releases, such as um, organophosphates, things like that. But again, this, any of these interventions would be immediate, life-threatening interventions that we can perform rapidly and then move on. Now, once we've sorted the patients, 
and we've gone through rapid assessment. We've applied what life-saving interventions we can. The patients then get moved to a treatment and transport area. So once they get moved to this casualty collection point, it may be a single point. On several large-scale incidents, there may be multiple casualty collection points based on the triage level. We may elect to have the most severe patients go to one and all the walking wounded go to another, which will allow responding units to focus on the most injured patients. Now, when we talk about different triage systems, we get into start and jump start. Now, start and jump start are based on the same modalities to slightly adapted for the pediatric patient, but these are designed to give providers an easily utilized procedure to quickly sort and categorize these patients. Ideally, you should take 30 to 60 seconds per patient. If they're all in a close nearby geographic area, we should be able to move very quickly in between them and triage 10 patients in 10 minutes. Let's say, for example, we go to an active shooter event at the local shopping mall. Once the shooter is down and it's safe for us to enter, we're in the video arcade and there are 10 patients there, we should be able with one provider to adequately triage 10 patients in 10 minutes. This is focusing primarily on sorting and counting and providing quantity of the patients and providing minimal immediate care. Again, most likely only life-threatening or life-saving interventions. Now, there are a few adaptations we'll talk about for Jumpstart, but to work through Start very quickly, imagine we're pulling up at a major incident at the local school. Let's say the bleachers collapse during Friday night football. As we roll up to the scene in the incident, we'll generally be approached, if not mobbed, by a large group of ambulatory and walking wounded. By virtually of being walking wounded, these patients are priority three or green tag patients. We should direct them to a casualty collection point. Go stand by those buses. Go stand by that gate. Go stand out on the football field if possible. Go stand in that end zone. We want to direct them not only away from the actual action area, but also away from the scene in our unit. The reasoning for this is the last thing we need to do is have 50 walking wounded patients decide they're all getting in our ambulance and now we can't even get to our equipment. As resources arrive and more per providers get there, we can assign one to two providers assigned to that location. They can reevaluate those patients, initiate simple care. In many cases, they'll set up a mobile treatment center right on scene where they can treat for multiple patients while we're waiting for more to respond. Now, as we get past those walking wounded patients, we realize that the remaining patients are all the non-walking wounded or non-ambulatory. As we get to each one, work to the closest one to you. If they're unresponsive, open the airway. If this has them breathing, that's great. We give them priority one. They are a red tag. They are the most severe. If they are not breathing after we've opened the airway, they will likely get priority four, which is a black tag, unfortunately. As we work beyond that, if we have a patient who is responsive, we go through a three-step assessment. The three-step assessment is designed not only to evaluate the patient, but it's designed to be done quickly, efficiently, with minimal equipment in hand. So, if the patient has respirations of over 30 per minute, they automatically become a red tag. If the patient is responsive and has capillary refill over two seconds, they would automatically become a red tag. If the patient's unable to follow simple commands, they would automatically become a red tag. However, if the patient passes all of the above tests successfully, but they're still not ambulatory, they would be prioritized to a yellow tag or priority two. So when we look at it in the big picture, the acronym looks something like this, or the algorithm. We start as we come up, the patients who are walking up to us, yes, they can go over there, become a priority three. We'll deal with that later, we can send other providers over later, but for now we need to work our way into the scene. We get to the first patient closest to us, are they breathing? If they're not, we open their airway. If they're still not breathing, they go all the way to the left to priority four. 
if they either are breathing after we open the airway, they become a priority one, or if they're breathing without us having to open the airway, we look at how they're breathing. If their respirations are under 30, great. If the respirations are over 30, they make it to priority one. We then evaluate capillary refill. Is it less than two seconds? If it is, we keep moving down the chain. If it's not, they default out and go to priority one. Lastly, can they follow a simple command? If they can, great, they keep going down and become a priority two. However, if they're unable to follow the command, they would go over to that priority one. So as we look, a failure of any one of those three, respirations, cap refill, or the inability to follow command, would get us in a priority one. If they pass all of them, they'd make priority two. Now, when we get into jumpstart, it's very similar to this. The big change is we start using it for pediatric patients. Now, some literature suggests using it for eight-year-olds and under, some say under 100 pounds, under 45 kilograms. However, in the midst of a mass casualty incident, you're likely not going to have a chance to figure all that out. As a good rule of thumb, if the victim appears to be a child, use jumpstart. If the victim appears to be an adult, you start. Somebody will be able to go behind you and correct this. The goal at this point is not to find out how old the child is. The goal is to triage and count as many people as possible to determine what your resource needs are. So now, as we come up, we have our walking wounded that we've sent over to the left. And then we have unresponsive patients. Well, we have a child unresponsive, we open the airway. If they're breathing, they get a priority one or a red tag. If they're not breathing, but they do have a pulse, we will attempt to give rescue breaths. These rescue breaths are our jumpstart breaths. And when we try to jumpstart the child, if the patient begins breathing on their own, great. We've gone ahead and made them a red tag. We've jumpstarted the child. However, if they do not begin breathing on their own, we'd make them into a priority four black tag. So, as we've worked through that, the next phase is we'll go through the remaining patients who are non-ambulatory. They're responsive, and so we'll go through our three-step assessment. On the three-step assessment for pediatric patients, you'll notice that where adults, it was respiratory rate over 30, they went to red tag. Now it's respiratory rate of under 15 or over 45, they go to red tag. This again was designed to take into account the difference in adult and child respiratory rates. The other two commands of capillary refill and unable to follow simple statements are still the same as they were. If the patient passes all the above successfully, they become a yellow tag. Otherwise, any failure in any one of the above categories becomes a red tag. Now let's look at the color coding of the tags. We talked about minor or green tags or priority threes. These would be the least severe. Delayed are the yellow tags. Immediate would be red tags. Expectant would be gray tags. And deceased would be black. Now when we talk about expectant patients, we'll get into it a little bit more later. These are patients who are extremely critically injured that although we may be able to save them, we don't have the initial resources. Now, once resources arrive, expectant patients may, by that point, have expired, and we move them into black, or we may decide at that point, if we have sufficient resources to devote, we can move them into red tag and commit the resources to trying to save them. Now, our triage categories are outlined by color as well. We get into minor, which is a green tag. These are patients who can typically be delayed up to three hours. In most cases, it's going to be the largest group of patients, and they can easily overwhelm and overrun your resources. One of the hardest parts for providers in dealing with any mass casualty incident is not only are these patients ambulatory up and around and able to move to you and follow you and move to other providers on their own, they can also typically be loud. They're very vocal. They can attract much more attention than, say, a patient who's unresponsive with a bullet hole in their chest. 
So therefore, one of the things we have to consider uh, is always, I'm not so much worried with who's screaming the loudest. I'm worried about who's not screaming. I'm not worried about who's crying the loudest. I'm worried about the patient who can't cry. And so we have to always be aware of not getting bogged down with getting several green tag patients coming towards you wanting care. We can always direct them to some point, the safety point or the casualty point, and say, please, wait over there. We have to get to everybody. Now, the next level of patients is our delayed patients. Now, delayed is yellow tag or priority two. They're still urgent patients, but we can delay transport theoretically up to an hour or more. These injuries require less immediate intervention. You may on scene initiate fluids or some pain management while waiting on transport. Largely, how much care we provide for intermediate patients on scene will be based on how large the incident is and how long we expect to be delayed there. In some cases, we may have to have yellow patients on scene for an hour or two waiting while we get the red tag out initially. Now, our red tag, our priority one. One is the worst, they've got to go first. These are patients with airway obstruction or compromise, patients with known or suspected pneumothorax, any patient with severe hemorrhage that we cannot control, especially abdominal hemorrhage, things like that, where we realize that these are critical patients that need to definitely get top priority billing. Any patient with a major injury to their head, neck, or torso, any patient with an altered level of consciousness, these are all our number one priority and they're going to go first. Now, as we move down the line, some agencies use a gray tag for expectant, some group it all into black, and largely that's based on agency or policy or protocol. It's not necessarily a standard. The goal of triaging anyone as expectant, gray tag, and not just doing black tag is these are patients we may wish to reconsider. A patient may have critical vital signs and not be responding to treatment. We may want to reconsider after things changes as more resources get there. We may try a brief attempt with BLS interventions and see what happens. This could likely be a patient who's mortally wounded. They're unlikely to survive without significant resource commitment. Let's take an active shooter, a patient who's had you know, several rounds to the chest, major wounds, and possibly some brain matter exposed. But they're still breathing, so where do they fit? Well, they're breathing on their own, but I don't think they'll be doing it for long. There's, so we'll go ahead and we'll say, this is an expectant. We're really triaging this person as, you know, they're black tag, they just don't know it yet. Now, if we had enough resources there, we may try to do something for that patient, but likely if we tried to commit all our resources there, we could actually let other patients slip through the cracks. So expectants are ones we can go back and look at after we've dealt with our immediate patients and determine if we want to try to put any one of those into immediate and send them out at that point. Lastly, deceased or black tag. At this point, there's no signs of life. There's no further efforts indicated. They're obviously mortally wounded. At this point, we identify them as a black tag and go from there. Now, throughout the presentation, we've talked about triage tags versus ribbons and different options. Overall, triage tags are wonderful. They can provide a great resource for tracking and documenting patient information, transport, destination, vital signs, some agencies use them as part of their very initial phase of triage on all calls, while some agencies tend to defer until they get to a casualty collection point or later in the patient care flow to initiate these. These agencies may actually use ribbon or tape to identify patient acuity for initial assessment. This is largely agency based on what your MCI is, what your plan is, uh, in my career, I have seen one agency that not only used the uh, nylon, lightweight nylon flagging tape to put on a patient's wrist during initial triage, so that that way, as the people doing the triage went through, if they put a red wrap of tape around the patient's wrist, that was to indicate to everybody coming behind them that those were priority ones that needed to be carried out first, and that allowed the triage personnel to move very quickly through the scenario. 
On the other side of that coin, I've seen some agencies that will say, okay, we're going to use triage tags as part of our initial triage, but we're only going to put a triage tag on the red tags initially. And that way, as litter bearers come through and as more resources come through, they'll see any patient with a triage tag is automatically a red tag, and we'll go through later after that. Also, some agencies will use black tags or have an angel position or a designated uh, position for uh, patients who are deemed deceased. And this is done so subsequent resources don't re-triage a deceased patient. Once the decision is made on the initial triage that this patient is deceased, no one else needs to look at that patient anymore because we can tell based on they've got either a black tag on them, a black flag on them, black tape, however it's done, and that's designed to, again, help manage and communicate to secondary or tertiary responders what you've got going on. I, largely, I have to tell you, this could be based on your agency's mass casualty approaches, and by all means, this is something we should be familiar with, we should review periodically, ideally, big believer in doing it once a month, not necessarily running a full-scale drill, but pull out the old MCI book, dust it off, take a look at it, and say, okay, if we run this today, if we have a school bus wreck today, if we have a, you know, tornado hit a wrestling mat, or hit the high school during a wrestling match or a basketball tournament, what are we going to do? We need to be ready for this because it's only a matter of time until it unfortunately happens. In closing, we know that MCIs are going to require a much different approach than other calls. Very seldomly in EMS in response are we going to be told you've got one minute to triage this patient, do as much good for them as you can, and move to the next one. Well, there are multiple systems that are implemented for field triage, you know, again, quickly, efficiently, and effectively, and again, know what your system is, know what one your agency uses, and it's very important after these events, responders have a chance to debrief regarding the situation and many times the decisions that were made. Sadly to say, triage can be a very, very difficult thing to do, especially when you're having to declare multiple black tags or in the case of, you know, significant injuries or illness, having to walk away and ignore somebody who's crying out for help, only to find out later that they expired. Hey there, I'd like to thank you all for stopping by checking out our video. If you want more information about our company or any of the stuff we do, you can check out our website. If you need EMS Continuing Education Hours, we do have our online education platform posted up there. Also, we have our email address if you have any questions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. We maintain channels on all of those. Also, please like, share this out to your friends, subscribe, help support the channel, and we'll keep putting more videos out there for you. Oh, well, enough about that. I know what I'm up for. Time for a cup of coffee. Y'all have a great day. Be safe out there. Bye. <laughs>